everything looks bigger than life when you're five. So everything was big, everything was strange, and I remember feeling, I, I guess, a bit scared. Like, like many children, I remember my school years fondly, but the bits I remember fondly aren't the bits I should have remembered. You know, I remember the, the play and the sport and the naughtiness and the playfulness and the, uh, the mischief. In fact, I remember the bits that were non-standard. It's incredibly privileged for me to have had education be such a, an important and, and uh, present part of my life. I remember being bored a lot. It didn't bring out the best in me, and uh, um, you know I got through it anyhow. So it's you know it wasn't I was not a great fit, or the system was not a great fit for me. Uh, it's kind of crazy when you think about it that we take all these children and we force them to try to adapt to this really complex bureaucracy, this, this system. The system should adapt to them. The origins of traditional education lie inside the military, to a large extent. They needed identical people soldiers, administrators, and so on, so they produced a system. When the Industrial Revolution happened, they too wanted uh, identical people in their assembly lines, even in their consumers. They wanted consumers to be identical so that everybody would buy the same things. So if you look at school that way, if you look at the fact that we process 20 or 30 kids at a time in a batch, just like in the factory, if you look at the fact that if you fail third grade, what do you do? We hold you back and we reprocess you all matching the way the factory works. We built it on purpose, and it was really useful for its function, but we don't have a shortage of factory workers anymore. We're probably at the, at the death of education right now. I think the structures and strictures of school, of learning from nine till three, uh, you know, working on your own, not working with others, uh, I think that is, that's, that's dead or dying, and I think learning is uh, is just beginning. Well, I had ADD when I was growing up. And now it's like so many people do. And there's this feeling that there's something broken about the kid because the kid doesn't conform to the system. So what we do is we medicate children to fit into the system as opposed to saying, wait, the system is here for the kids. And there's lots of people who quite easily can sit still for eight hours and take notes and then two weeks later say back what they wrote down. But there's also this huge population of extraordinarily talented, engaged people who can't learn that way. There's a very big difference between access to information and school. They used to be the same thing. Information is there online to anyone of the billion people who's got access to the internet. So what that means is if we give access to a four-year-old or an eight-year-old or a 12-year-old, they will get the information if they want it. Knowing, knowing something is probably an obsolete idea. You don't actually need to know anything. You can find out at the point when you need to know it. It's the teacher's job to point young minds towards the right kind of question. The teacher doesn't need to give any answers. His answers are everywhere. And we know now from years of measurements that learners who find the answers for themselves retain it better than if they're told the answer. Education has been very, very, very slow to look at data, to look at numbers, to look at analysis, what's actually happening. You know, we measure a test here, an exam there, but the detail of what's happening we don't really have. And uh, that will be for sure the next important thing in our pockets, our ability to analyse where we are. Some of the people watching this will already be analysing their health and their well-being and their sport. They'll be analysing their learning too soon. And then we'll be really good at it. Newton is a data mining and an adaptive learning platform that allows anybody, anywhere, to upload content 
They could be a, a publisher or an individual teacher, anything in between, and produce a course that will be uniquely personalized to each student based on what she knows, how she learns best. The textbook of the future is going to be delivered on connected devices. What that means is the incredible amount of data that students have always produced when they studied are now capturable and usable. So Newton and any product built on Newton can figure out things like, you learn math best in the morning between 8.32 and 9.14 a.m. You learn science best in 40 minute bite sizes. At the 42 minute mark, your click rate always begins to decline. You should pull that from you then and move you to something else to keep you engaged. Uh, that 35 minute burst you do with lunch every day, you're not retaining any of that. Just hang out with your friends and do that stuff in the afternoon instead when you learn better. Um, you learn this stuff best with short questions, this stuff best with complicated, difficult questions. We should return this type of material to you four days later for optimal retention. And here's exactly the things you're going to struggle with at your homework tonight because you haven't learned some of the concepts that are embedded in that material. And we can go in real time, grab you the perfect little bit of content from last month or last year and put that seamlessly in front of you so that you don't struggle. We can predict failure in advance and prevent it from happening. We're going to move from this kind of alienating and in some cases boring and some cases frustrating model of everybody gets the exact same stuff. They're getting it at the exact same time, the exact same order, the exact same difficulty level. You know, for half the class it's too hard, for half the class it's, it's, it's too boring. It's going to get the most advanced kids the most stimulating material, it's going, to get, it's going to get them to unlock their potential in a way that they're not today. But for every kid, no matter how much you're struggling, you've got a path to success. It might take you a little longer, but you will have a path to success no matter what. And also, the system gets smarter and smarter as, as more people use it. Strategies compete against each other to be, uh, to be replicated in the next generation. So the strategy that's most effective for you, once we find that, any kid who's like you in the future will have that strategy teed up. It's a whole new thing. It's like, you know, when people, you know, when the automobile was invented, people didn't, weren't asking for the automobile, they were asking for faster horses. And people aren't really asking for, for Newton because they don't really know what it is yet. But once they, once they see it and experience it, they, then they get it right away. You know, people um, say that education moves very slowly suddenly you just need to be connected that changes everything it changes the basis on which you can make a contribution you know your your brain can make a contribution at a distance it's one thing to sit here in the media lab and and talk about the future uh, i go very often into places which are about as different from media lab as it can get and i think to myself what what does what's the value of all my ideas over here but there is one great hope. Wherever I go, the very first thing that I ask or I take out my phone and check for is do I have even that little bandwidth which will give me GPRS or something equivalent to that. And in the middle of jungles, I find that sometimes it says connected. And I know then that everything that I'm saying can go everywhere and work exactly the same way. It's a question of time. Connectivity is actually opening up the world. If you open up a village, for example, Bonsasso, and the students can actually now communicate with other students, say, in London, it means they start seeing the world in a different way. Educate a youth and you educate a nation. Connect to Learn is a partnership between Ericsson, together with Earth Institute in Columbia University, and the Millennium Promise. It's twofold. It provides scholarships to girls, and um, Connect to Learn gives students computers and connectivity and shows them how to use it and how to get information. Education was limited to what the teacher could tell the students and the teacher was relying on that small textbook or those few books So he was not getting that exposed now You are able to have access to a lot a lot of information and the children start chatting and exchanging information And you know you can see there's much more 
things for them to talk about because they feel like they are more exposed. And you know, the children are more confident. They have the energy. They have quite a lifespan ahead of them. And they are able to start thinking bigger. If you bring connectivity to them, they are actually able to do transactions and they can start small businesses which will uplift them. So I would say it is actually just opening up villages and the whole country and actually to say the whole continent. We are rolling it out in as many countries as possible in Africa and also in South America. It has potential to be upscaled to any country. The way we solve interesting problems is we fail and we fail and we fail and we fail until we succeed. And if you talk to people who have succeeded, what they almost all have in common is that they failed a hundred times before they succeeded. And that what separates them from people who aren't successful isn't that they succeeded, it's that they failed more than the other people did. I'm not sure it's okay for the schools to say, well, we have to optimize to process as many people as we can to match this testing regime. You can't imagine in a world where you sit down to do an exam and you ask yourself the question, I hope there are no surprises on the exam paper. And your teachers think, I hope I've prepared him for everything. How would that prepare you then to go out into a world that every day is going to surprise you? You know, it's full of the surprises of, of the economy, of society, of politics, of invention, of technology. Every day is a surprise. Learning prepares you to cope with the surprises. Education prepares you to cope with certainty. There is no certainty. The teacher stands between the child and the formal education, trying to, to make the child face that system. And until that system breaks down or disappears, she has an incredibly difficult job of keeping the child's curiosity alive and at the same time saying, listen, by the time you're 16, you'll have to start memorizing certain things so that you can go and sit for that examination, clear it, and, and get out of school properly. No one I know takes standardized tests for a living. So why are we using standardized tests to see if you're gonna be good when we don't have standardized tests after you take it? It's infected the entire marketing ecosystem of education because famous colleges are famous because they're picky about your SAT scores. Parents want their kids to go to a famous college. Parents push the school to create kids who will get into a famous college by doing well on the SAT. All of which is corrupting the entire reason we have education in the first place. If we can get parents and teachers and kids and administrators to have this conversation, to just talk about it, that if at school board meetings or if at tenure reviews, the questions we are asking are not how did your students do on the SAT? But instead we say, the SAT makes no sense, famous colleges are a scam, we need to create a different thing. And if we can have this conversation, then change will start to happen. Coursera is a social entrepreneurship company that enables the best universities to take their best courses and put them out there so that everyone around the world with an internet connection can benefit from having access to a great education. As of today, which is the end of September, we have 1.5 million students from, I think, 196 countries. It's a little debatable how you count countries. We have uh, 195 courses from 33 universities. Our larger courses have an enrollment of 130,000. Our smaller courses have an enrollment of only about 10,000. Of course, it's still growing. Most of them haven't actually launched yet. Um, and a median class when it launches has about 50 to 60,000 students registered. Hello everyone and welcome to the class of Problem Listening Reference. 
scale is interesting because it allows us to offer a high quality product at a very low marginal cost per student, which is what allows us to take people who really can't pay for an education and to provide them a free education, an education for free at the highest quality because the costs are so low per student. The student experience in Coursera is that the course starts on a given day and each week a student has access to numerous pieces. One piece is video lectures and it's interactive video so you don't sit there for an hour just watching video, you get to interact with the video. There is rigorous meaningful assessments of different kinds, not just multiple choice but real exercises with real depth. And there is a community of students that you get to interact with to ask questions and have those questions answered by your fellow students so that you get both a better learning experience via peer teaching as well as a social experience where you feel like there's a community of learners surrounding this intellectual activity. People often ask us whether universities are a thing of the past, whether universities are going to die out, and I definitely do not think so. Um, there is something tremendous about getting people together in a place where serendipitous interactions can happen, where you could have face-to-face -face mentoring between an instructor and students, where students can talk to each other and create together and learn to debate ideas. And so this on-campus physical experience at the moment has no virtual substitute that is equally effective. Our goal here, and I think one needs to be pragmatic about this, is not to equalize necessarily the opportunity um, of students who currently don't have any access and make it equal to what a fortunate Princeton student might have. Uh, because that might be a really worthy goal, but it's not something we necessarily can achieve in the short time frame. What we'd like to do is we'd like to bring both of these up to considerably better than where they are now, even if they don't end up being equal. If we've improve, improved a lot of both the on-campus students and the ones who currently don't have access, I think we've done an amazing thing. So let me explain how revolutions work. Revolutions destroy the perfect and then they enable the impossible. They never go from everything is good to everything is good. There's a lot of noise in the middle. If we look at the music business, first it destroyed the record label business, the internet, and only now is it enabling independent musicians to get heard. Education tends to move in stair step. Uh, functions in terms of change, so when it does change, it, it explosively changes. The move from, you know, pre-printing press to post-printing press, that's a one-time transition in the history of, of the world in terms of education. Online education is going to be like that as well, and we want to make sure that as a species, the human species gets it right. One of the revolutions that we're going to see is where less and less of education is about conveyal of content because that's going to be a commodity and hopefully one that's available to everyone around the world. And a lot more of what we think of as education is going to go back to its original roots of teaching where the instructor actually engages in a dialogue with the students and helps them um, develop thinking skills, problem solving skills, passion for the discipline and the kinds of things that are much easier to do in a face-to-face -face setting and a lot harder to do in an online format, but for which really the college experience as we know it, that is the right place where you would like to put that kind of development of skills. So now what I want to see from school is get kids to want it. Create an environment where kids are restless until their need for information is satisfied. Teach kids to solve interesting problems, not to memorize answers to problems we've already solved. Every time I get a question right, I get immediate engagement. I think the teacher has to step back and say, today's topic is this. But open your notebook and figure it out for yourself. What we need are teachers who will look people in the eye and believe in them and push them forward and it's hard to do that on the internet it really needs to be done in person schools decide to be better because they see children being better and teachers what does it say on a teacher's t-shirt it says we're in it for the outcome not the income you know teachers are there because they can see the change in their children if you add up every child in history more children will leave school in the next 30 years than they've ever left school in history 
if I was going to make one change, I'd make their schooling just a little bit better. <laughs> and that will change history faster than anything else.